Chapter 11 Many times man lives and dies. Between his two eternities, that of race and that of soul, and ancient Ireland knew it all. Whether man die in his bed, or the rifle knocks him dead, a brief parting from those dear is the worst man has to fear. Though grave diggers toil is long, sharp their spades their muscles strong. They but thrust their buried men back in the human mind again. W.B. Yates Elizabeth sobbed softly as she sat in the familiar recliner. Her mascara was running in jagged lines away from her eyes. I gave her a tissue, and she dabbed absent-mindedly at her eyes as the black mascara lines gained speed in their descent toward her chin. She had just finished recounting a life as an Irish woman, a life that had ended peacefully and with much happiness. Yet the stark contrast to her current life, with its losses and despair, was causing her pain. And so she cried, despite the happy ending. These were tears of sadness, not of joy. The day's session had begun much less dramatically. Elizabeth had only recently regained the energy and self-confidence to enter into a relationship, this time a short-term encounter with an elder man. Elizabeth was initially attracted to him because he had money and position. But there was no chemistry, at least not on her part. Her head urged her to settle, to accept that he was secure, he seemed to care for her quite a bit, and who else was there for her anyway? Elizabeth's heart said no, do not settle, you do not love him, and without love, what is there? Her heart's argument finally won. He was pressing her to deepen the relationship, to have sex, to make commitments. Elizabeth decided to end it. She was relieved, sad to be lonely again, but not depressed. Overall, she was handling the end of this relationship very appropriately. And yet here she was, eyes red, nose stuffy, mascara running wildly. When we started the regression process, Elizabeth lapsed into a deep trance, and I took her back in time once again. This time she emerged in Ireland, several centuries ago. I'm very pretty, she commented immediately upon finding herself. I have dark hair and light blue eyes. I dress very plainly and wear no makeup or jewelry. As if I'm hiding. My skin is so white, like cream. Hiding from what? I inquired, following her lead. She was silent for a few moments, looking for the answer. From my husband. Yes, from him. Oh, he's allowed. He drinks too much, and he becomes violent. He's so selfish. I curse this marriage. Why did you choose him? I innocently asked. I did not choose him. I would never choose him. My parents chose him, and now they are dead. They are dead, but I still have to live with him. He is all I have now, she said, a fragile sadness joining the anger in her voice. Do you have any children? Does anyone else live with you? I asked. No. Her anger was subsiding, but the sadness was more evident now. I cannot. I had a miscarriage. There was a great deal of bleeding and infection. They say I can't bear children. He is angry at me for that, too. He blames me for not bearing him sons. As if I wanted this. She was upset again. He hits me, she added, in a suddenly soft voice. He hits me as if I were a dog. I hate him for that. She stopped talking and tears formed in the corners of her eyes. He hits you, I echoed. Yes, she answered simply. I waited for more, but she was reluctant to elaborate. Where does he hit you? I pressed. On my back, my arms, my face. Everywhere. Can you stop him? At times. I used to hit back, but then he hurts me more. He drinks too much. The best thing I can do is accept the beating. Eventually he tires and stops. Until the next time. Look at him closely, I urged her. Look into his eyes. See if you recognize him as anyone in your current life. Elizabeth's eyes narrowed, and her brow furrowed, as if she were looking, even though her eyelids remained closed. I do know him. It's George. It's George. Good. You are back in that lifetime. The beatings have stopped. She had recognized the banker, George, with whom she had had a relationship a year and a half earlier. That relationship had ended when George became physically abusive. Patterns such as abusiveness can persist over many lifetimes if they are not recognized and broken. At some subconscious level Elizabeth and George had remembered each other. They had come together once again, and he tried to resume the abuse. However, Elizabeth had learned an important lesson over the centuries. This time Elizabeth had the strength and self-respect to end their relationship soon after the abuse began. 
When past life origins are discovered, it is even easier to break destructive patterns. I looked over at Elizabeth. She was quiet. She seemed so sad and hopeless. I had enough information about her abusive husband, and I decided to move her ahead in time. I will count backward from 3 to 1 and tap you lightly on the forehead, I told her. As I do this, move ahead to the next significant event in this life. Let it come into complete focus in your mind as I count. See what happens to you. On the count of one, she began to smile blissfully. I was glad there was a little light in this bleak life. He has died, thank God, and I am so happy, she gushed. I am with a man I love. He is so kind and gentle. He never hits me. We love each other. He's a very good man. We are happy together. Her blissful smile never faded. How did your husband die? I inquired. In a tavern, she answered, as her smile faded. He was killed in a fight. They tell me that he was stabbed in the chest with a long knife. It must have pierced his heart. They tell me blood was everywhere. I am not sad that he died, she continued. I would not have met John otherwise. John is a wonderful man. Her radiant smile had returned. Once again I pressed forward. Go ahead in time, I instructed, and see what happens to you and John. Go to the next significant event in your lives. She was silent, scanning the ears. I am very weak. My heart is fluttering so, she gasped. I cannot catch my breath. She had progressed to the day of her death. Is John around? I asked. Oh, yes. He's sitting on the bed and holding my hand. He's very concerned, very attentive. He knows he's going to lose me. We are sad about this but happy that we lived so many good years together. She paused, remembering the scene with John at her bedside. Only Elizabeth's relationship with her beloved mother had approached this incredible level of love, joy, and intimacy she had shared with John. Look closely at John. Look at his face and in his eyes. See if you recognize him as someone in your present life. Recognition often immediately occurs with an unmistakable certainty when a patient looks into the other person's eyes. The eyes may truly be the window to the soul. No, she said simply. I do not know him. She paused again, then spoke with alarm in her voice. My heart is giving out, she declared. It's very erratic now. I feel like I want to leave this body now. It's okay. Leave that body. Tell me what happens to you. After a few moments, she began to describe the events following her death. Her face looked peaceful, her breathing relaxed. I am hovering above and to the side of my body, near the corner of the ceiling. I can see John sitting with my body. He's just sitting there. He doesn't want to move. He will be all alone now. We only had each other. Then you never had children. I asked, for clarification. No, I could not. But that was not important. We had each other, and that was enough for us. She lapsed back into silence, her face still very peaceful, a small smile forming. It is so beautiful here. I am aware of a beautiful light all around me. It pulls at me, and I want to follow it. It is a beautiful light. It restores you with energy. Go ahead, I agreed. We travel through a beautiful valley, with trees and flowers all around. I am becoming aware of many things, much information, much knowledge. But I don't want to forget about John. I must remember John, and if I learn all these other things, I might forget John, and I can tea. You will remember John, too, I advised, but I was not really sure. What was this other knowledge she was being given? I asked her. It is all about lifetimes and energies, about how we use our lifetimes to perfect our energy so that we can move on to higher worlds. They are telling me about energy and about love and how these are the same. When we understand what love really is. But I do not want to forget about John. I will remind you all about John. Good. Is there more? No, that is all for now. Dot quote. Then she added, we can learn more about love by listening to our intuitions. Perhaps this last comment had more levels of meaning, especially for me. Years earlier the masters, speaking through Catherine, had told me at the very end of her sessions and their amazing revelations, what we tell you is for now. You must now learn through your own intuition. There would be no more revelations through Catherine's hypnosis. Elizabeth rested. There would be no further revelations today either. I awakened her, and after her mind reoriented to the present time, she began to cry softly. 
Why are you crying? I gently asked her. Because I loved him so much, and I don't think I will ever love someone that much again. I've never met any man that I could love like that, and who loved me back the same way. And without that love, how can my life ever be complete? How can I ever be completely happy? You never know, I objected, but without much conviction. You could meet someone and fall madly in love again. You could even meet John again, in another body. Sure, she said with some sarcasm. Her tears kept falling. You're just trying to make me feel better. I've got a better chance of winning the lottery than of finding him again. The odds of winning the lottery, I remembered, were 14 million to 1. Asterisk in through time into healing, I described the reunion of Ariel and Anthony. A reunion with a soulmate after a long and involuntary separation can be an experience worth waiting for even if the wait is one of centuries. On a vacation in the southwest, my former patient, Ariel, a biologist, met an Australian named Anthony. Both were emotionally mature individuals who had been married before, and they quickly fell in love and became engaged. Back in Miami, Ariel suggested that Anthony have a regression session with me just to see if he could have the experience and to see what came up. They were both curious to find out whether Ariel would appear in any way in Anthony's regression. Anthony turned out to be a superb regression subject. Almost instantly, he returned to a very vivid North African lifetime around the time of Hannibal, more than 2000 years ago. In that lifetime, Anthony had been a member of a very advanced civilization. His particular tribe was fair-skinned, and they were gold smelters who had the ability to use liquid fire as a weapon by spreading it on the surface of rivers. Anthony was a young man in his mid-twenties in the midst of fighting a 40-day war with a neighboring, darker-skinned tribe that vastly outnumbered the defenders. Anthony's tribe had actually trained some of the members of the enemy tribe in the art of warfare, and one of the former trainees was leading the assault. 100,000 of the enemy tribe carrying swords and hatchets were crossing a large river on ropes as Anthony and his people spread liquid fire on their own river, hoping it would reach the attackers before the attackers reached the shore. To protect their women and children, the defending tribe put most of them on large boats with violet sails in the middle of a huge lake. Among this group was Anthony's young and beloved fiancée, who was perhaps 17 or 18 years old. However, the liquid fire suddenly burned out of control, and the boats caught fire. Most of the tribe's women and children perished in this tragic accident, including Anthony's fiancée, who was his great passion. This tragedy broke the morale of the warriors, and they were soon defeated. Anthony was one of the few who escaped the slaughter through brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Eventually, he escaped to a secret passageway that led to a warren of rooms underneath the large temple where the tribe's treasures were stored. There Anthony had found one other living person, his king. The king commanded Anthony to kill him, and Anthony, a loyal soldier, complied against his will. After the king's death, Anthony was all alone in the dark temple, where he used his time to write the history of his people on gold leaf and to seal the writing in large urns or jars. It was here that he eventually died of starvation and grief over the loss of his fiancée and his people. There was one more detail. His fiancée in that lifetime reincarnated as Ariel in this lifetime. The two of them reunited as lovers after 2000 years. Finally, the long postponed wedding would take place. Anthony and Ariel had only been separated for one hour when he stepped out of my office. But the power of their reunion was such that it was as though they had not seen each other for 2000 years. Recently Ariel and Anthony were married. Their sudden and intense and seemingly coincidental meeting now has an AW layer of meaning to them, and their already passionate relationship is now infused with a sense of continuous adventure. Anthony and Ariel plan to take a trip to North Africa to try and find the location of their past life together and to see what other details they can uncover. They know W that whatever they find can only increase the adventure they find in each other.